You're watching Power Nation. Today on Engine Power, we build a hard-pulling big block Chevy. And we brought along some friends to help. Not bad. Let's check that out. Hey, yeah. look at that. there we go. Pretty good. Hey everyone, welcome to Engine Power. Usually you see us build engines that make power in the mid to upper RPM ranges because they are application specific. Well today we're doing something a little bit different. We've been getting a lot of requests and comments for doing something in the low RPM range. So today is your lucky day. We dug through the warehouse and found us an engine we think is a suitable candidate. This is a 454 Chevy out of an 80s one ton. Now we don't know a whole lot about it because it is a takeout. So we decided to get it up on the pump and see what it's all about and see if it's worthy to work on. And speaking of working on it, we're going to have some help today in the shop and they're from Frankie's Friends. That's right. I'm a graduate of the University of Northwestern Ohio and I still have several friends that are current students. So I decided to invite a few of them down so they could help us out installing some budget minded upgrades to increase some low end torque on our big block 454. The University of Northwestern Ohio, located in the city of Lima, is highly regarded for their College of Applied Technologies, which includes programs in automotive, diesel, and high-performance technology. The curriculum is roughly 30% textbook instruction and 70% hands-on experience. We have our textbook side, which is all, you know, all great and everything, but the hands-on side really ties everything together and allows you, as a student, to get the best experience out of everything. You read it one day, go out and work on it the next day. It's honestly a great experience and fantastic for learning. The coursework, along with many opportunities such as internships and industry-specific clubs, let students explore a wide variety of fields, giving them the time and experience they need to discover and grow their interests and passions in the automotive world. So they can bounce around, try this job, try that job, try the next job, until they find the perfect fit. And when they come back and I get that email or I get that phone call, and I get to talk to them about how excited they are and hearing that they've built that confidence in themselves and their future, it's more rewarding than anything I ever thought I would expect. We're a big enough school to give a lot of amazing opportunities and that's why our graduates get to go all over the world. But it's also small enough to feel like home. With small class sizes, students receive plenty of one-on-one -on -one interaction and they are encouraged to ask questions. It's a great environment because it's not like a huge mega school. It's still a small enough environment where you can connect to each other fairly easily. My favorite part is uh, definitely working with some of the instructors. I'm able to ask them questions and get honest answers to create my own opinions on things. Joining us today are some guys that I actually went to school with, my good buddies, John Hartman and Jack Rush. So this guys, this thing made like 460 pound feet and around 305 horsepower. So the idea is to increase some low RPM torque while still going easy on the wallet. We don't want to like blow the budget out the window. So and doing that, we are going to retain the stock cylinder heads, obviously the stock block, but we need to move some more air through this engine. So, well, what's the best way to do that? My thoughts is we can change the camshaft. That's a real good budget friendly. I would agree option. with that. That'll work. I mean, we can keep the stock heads and just waking it up with a camshaft. I think is a good idea. Flat tap it. If we keep it flat tap it, it's still pretty affordable. So. So if we're changing the camshaft, aren't we going to have to change the valve train up? Yeah, we can go ahead and see what springs are in there. Maybe we'll do a spring upgrade and we could even do some roller rocker arms because that's a pretty affordable way to kind of improve the valve train. So now that being said, before we do any of that, I want to get this engine completely apart because it is an unknown quantity. It's a takeout engine. So I'd like to check all the bearings, make sure there's nothing wrong with it internal, make sure we have something good to work with. Now you guys have one of these dynos, so I think you know how to remove this and get it on engine stand. So uh, uh, you're up. Yes, sir. Let's do it. All right. I'm going to stay right. out of the way. So. Oh, geez. Yeah. Beautiful. Both Jack and John have earned their associate's degrees in automotive high performance technology, and they are in the process of earning their bachelor's of science degrees in business. John has concentrations on automotive aftermarket and marketing, and Jack has a concentration on marketing. Takeout engines can sometimes be full of unpleasant surprises, but the oil looks great, so that's a good sign. So far, looks pretty so good. good. Yeah, a little dark. As we continue the teardown, we don't see any indications of heavy wear or damage. 
That looks pretty good to me. The piston tops are pretty clean, and there's even a fair amount of crosshatch in the bores. We'll get the oil pump out, mark all the rods, and then pull all the rod and piston assemblies out. The rod bearings have slight wear, but nothing alarming, so we'll reuse them. Oh, nice, you guys found the rod boots, huh? Yep, sure did. Those Don't wanna important. scratch up the journal when we take the rod out. Exactly. Got it. So what are you guys looking for when you pull those out? So on the top of the piston, we will check for uh, detonation and see if we have any pinging. Uh, for the rings, we want to make sure that they spin freely. If they should get stuck, we could have a larger issue. And we'll also look at the skirts and see if there's any uh, extra wear that could cause some potential issues. Not too bad. It looks about the same as the rod bearings. So. Coming up, will our mix of existing parts and carefully calculated upgrades lead to success in the dyno cell? We'll find out. Today, Pat and I are taking things a little easier because we've got Jack Rush and John Hartman from UNOH working in the shop. The rebuild begins by installing the old bearings and the new Victor Rhines rear main seal. To keep costs low, we'll reuse the stock main cap fasteners, which get torqued to 110 pound-feet. We will be reusing our stock rod and piston assemblies because, quite frankly, they're in fantastic shape. But we do want to improve the ring seal. One way we could potentially do that would be to gas port the piston. Gas porting is common in high-performance engines for improving ring seal by drilling into the top ring land, either horizontally or vertically, to let combustion pressure in behind the ring and forcing it out on the cylinder. But there are some distinct disadvantages to doing that, one being weakening the top of the piston, and that can cause all types of problems. Problems. Total Seal has developed a better way of gas porting by integrating the port into the top of the piston ring itself. This is more efficient in allowing gas pressure to travel behind the ring and force it outwards against the cylinder wall, providing a tighter ring seal, which leads to higher efficiency and horsepower. The ring is made of 440B stainless steel, utilizes Total Seal's proprietary AP ring process, and has an aerospace grade C33 PVD face coating for a longer lifespan. After gapping the rings for our application, they are installed with the ports facing up. Since the original rod bearings are in great shape, we'll slide them into place and get them prepped for installation. We'll use Total Seal assembly lube on the new ring set, making sure to work it into the ring lands. We'll also apply a thin film to the cylinder bores. This is critical to establish proper ring seal during startup. With the short block wrapped up, we'll reinstall the aftermarket oil pump that came with the engine, torquing the stud to 65 pound-feet. Following John's budget-friendly advice, we're installing a new CompCam's hydraulic flat tappet camshaft from Summit Racing Equipment. At 50,000 lift, it has 234 degrees of intake duration and 244 degrees of exhaust duration. Lobe separation angle is 112 degrees. John's degreed plenty of cams at UNOH, so we'll let him take the wheel on this one. It comes in at 105 and a half degrees of intake center line, which is six and a half degrees advanced. With a new Victor Rhines gasket, the used timing cover is reinstalled. Now that we've got our timing cover on, we can move on to our oil pan. We're going to be sealing that up with a Victor Rhines one-piece oil pan gasket. It's molded rubber around a steel core and has compression stops so the gasket doesn't smush out when you tighten it down. Victor Rhines is well known in the European market, but they also have a wide variety of gaskets for U.S. manufacturers for both old and late model vehicles. For our 454, they have things like intake and exhaust manifold gaskets, oil pan gaskets, timing cover sets, and even a complete head gasket set. For any surfaces that need a little help sealing, we're going to be using Victor Rhine's Rhinzo Seal. This works in many different applications because it's good from negative 58 all the way up to 572 degrees Fahrenheit. It's also resistant to fuels, oils, grease, water, and even salt water for marine applications. We'll put a little bit on the mating surfaces of our block, put our gasket on, and then we can get our oil pan bolted down. Yeah. 
The new lifters are Chevrolet Performance hydraulic flat tappets from Summit Racing Equipment. They receive installation loop and are slid into the block. Finally, we'll reinstall the Summit Bracket Racer Harmonic Damper, which is SFI approved. Up next, the big block gets a heavy duty EFI system that's ready to rumble. John and Jack are hard at work on our big block Chevy build, setting true TDC on the balancer and lapping the valves. What's the reason you lap valves? We're looking for that seat to valve contact and seeing how it seals up. Mm -hmm. That tells you what kind of concentricity you have. If you have some nice even seal around the valve. This one was running okay, so I'm not expecting any problems, so. That's fine. You got it now. Perfect. With our head gaskets in place and our short block looking sharp, it's time to reinstall our cast iron stock and actually very heavy peanut port cylinder heads. And we will be bolting them down with ARP hardware. ARP goes through an extensive measurement and engineering process to ensure that the right amount of fastener is in the cylinder head and has proper thread engagement into the block so the fastener works like it's supposed to. ARP has several different materials to use depending on your application, from 8740 chrome molly, stainless steel, or more exotic things. One thing that's important is ARP includes with every kit they sell some very detailed and precise instructions on how to install their fasteners. Since our head bolts go into the water jacket, they receive ARP ultra torque lube under the bolt head and sealant on the threads. Perfect, continue on. I'll stay out of the way. Following ARP's instructions, the head bolts are torqued in three equal steps to a final value of 70 pound-feet. We'll reuse the stock push rods and apply some extreme pressure lube to both ends. Now, what rockers are those, Jack? These are the Comp Cams Pro Magnums. It's a really nice rocker. It's the 1.7 ratio, which happens to be the stock ratio. Very nice. We'll install them in the firing order, setting them one half turn past zero lash as we go. So ha half turn past that. All right. To give our engine a clean, timeless look, we'll paint it gloss black. Since our engine is gonna be used in a street or towing application, we wanted to go with a nice fuel injection setup over a carburetor. This is gonna make cold starts, fuel efficiency, and drivability much, much better. We chose to go with Phytech's GoPort EFI system, and it comes with pretty much everything you need to get it running, including a wiring harness with a few simple connections, an O2 sensor, and a handheld that can do all the setup and tuning. We've already gone ahead and pre-assembled our setup, including our 80 pound an hour fuel injectors, which makes the system good for up to 1,050 horsepower, our painted fuel rails, our coolant temp sensor in the front, and our throttle body on top. This is really nice because the module is mounted inside, so you don't have to worry about mounting it in the car. All we have to do now is get this system installed, and then we're one step closer to the dyno. Some weather strip adhesive will hold the Victor Ryan's intake manifold gaskets in place and a bead of rinds of seal is laid down on the china wall. This Phytech injection kit uses an Edelbrock EFI intake manifold that will fit any oval port big block Chevy. It drops right into place and is cinched down with some ARP fasteners. Valve train assembly spray lubricates the springs for protection during initial startup. Victor Rhine's molded rubber gaskets will seal up our repainted valve covers. The fuel injection system requires an O2 sensor, so Jack makes good use of the welding skills he learned at UNOH, adding a bung for the sensor and an evac port. We got our Moroso evac system as a kit from Summit Racing Equipment. It's a very affordable way to add a little extra power to your engine. After a few simple connections, our Phytech unit powers right up, and the ECU can be programmed for the engine. Up next, we give our engine spark, 
and then we fire it up. One of the last and possibly most important systems we need to install on our engine is the ignition system, and that starts with a good spark plug. We use E3 spark plugs all the time, and we always have great results. We've even done some testing to show their performance gains. Their plugs have some really unique features that make them stand out from a traditional J-wire style plug. First, they have an open ground electrode, which helps direct the spark and flame front into the combustion chamber faster. They also have sharp edges on both electrodes, which helps start the migration of electrons, making it easier to initiate a spark. This means that more of the air fuel mixture can be burned before the exhaust valve opens, increasing efficiency and power. It's also important that spark plugs have a long lifespan, and E3 plugs have been tested and proven to maintain power better over standard plugs for up to 20 million combustion cycles. We'll apply a little bit of anti-seize lubricant to the threads to keep them from galling on installation, and more importantly, removal after the engine has run at operating temperature. Now that we've got our spark plugs installed, we can move on to how we're actually going to generate the spark. We're going to be doing that with a Bertronix ignition bundle. This is for a small block or big block Chevy, and it all starts with one of their low resistance 45,000 volt flamethrower 2 ignition coils. This is going to feed one of their ready to run billet distributors, and it has a flamethrower igniter 2 module in it. The best part about these is that they are a ready to run distributor, so there's only two wires to hook up one to an ignition, and one to the negative post on the coil. From there, we'll be using a set of their 8mm universal 90 degree boot wires to distribute it to each spark plug. We've already gone ahead and pre-assembled these, but this whole thing comes as a complete kit. So now that it's all ready, all we have to do is get it on our engine. After lubing the gear, the distributor drops into place. We'll install the coil in a temporary mount for use in the dyno cell. Engines have advanced in both technology and outright power at a very rapid pace in the last 10 years, which is a good thing, but a lot of the stresses associated with that performance fall on engine oil to keep efficiency up and the engine living. A great way to fortify any oil's ability to protect your investment is to add FR3 Friction Reducer from Hot Shots Secret. Three patented technologies combine to reduce friction, lower oil operating temps, and improve both shear and oxidation stability in any oil you add it to. It uses carbon nano lubricant molecules that attach to microscopic irregularities of machined surfaces to increase film strength and decrease wear up to 43%, which can also increase your engine's efficiency and free up some horsepower. This is a 100% synthetic formula that can not only protect and reduce friction in your engine, it can be used in any closed lubrication system like your transmission, differentials, power steering, you get the idea. Dosage is about 1.5 ounces of FR3 per quart of oil. It is safe for both gas and diesel applications and all conventional or synthetic oils. The bottle has some handy increments on it, so with 10 and a half ounces, we're gonna run it right down just below the six ounce mark. All right, I think we got her. What are you guys gonna do? Make more power, hopefully. <laughs> That's okay. You guys ready? Oh, well, I'm ready. Let's go. All right. Oh, it made more power. Oh yeah. I'm not sure if it made mm. more torque. <laughs> A little bit. Oh, it did oh, make more yeah. torque. Ooh, Look at that. Okay. Uh, the big block put out 387 horsepower, a gain of 82 peak compared to our baseline run. It made 471 pound-feet of torque, a gain of 10 peak over the baseline. We made several runs and made some adjustments, deciding on 36 degrees of total timing and a 13 to 1 target air-fuel ratio. We also ran the engine a little higher, from 2,500 to 5,000 RPM.
Oh, yeah. That's a big difference. Uh, yeah, That's really big. After, mm -hmm. after 3,500, it just crushes the other one right into the earth. So. Our final numbers are 390 horsepower and 473 pound-feet of torque. Compared to the peak horsepower and torque numbers, the averages tell the real story. The engine picked up 22 average horsepower and 25 pound-feet of torque, all below 5,000 RPM. I mean, Guys, you, you're the ones that uh, put this together. What do you think? Yeah. It's amazing. Like, you go from the whole, it was on the dyno before, we tear down, build it back up. Like, it's all experience. It's great to see it on the dyno, making more power. What do you think? Looks great. It's running great. As you see by the numbers, the improvements that we tried to make are happening. So I'd say pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Well, you guys had a huge part in that. I mean, we honestly, we didn't really do too much. You guys did most I, of it. I, so. I didn't do anything. So. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is, this is an engine that you guys built. We'd like to thank John and Jack for their work on this build, two guys who are dedicated to their profession. The only thing you can control is your attitude and your effort. There's resources, there's tools, there's people that are willing to help you. You just have to put in the effort in order to do so. If you liked what you saw here, go to PowerNationTV.com for more.